morning. Welcome to the live stream for the First Baptist Church of Venus, Texas. My name is Alan Davidson, and I'm the pastor, and we are so glad that you have made us part of your Sunday morning as we join together and open the Word of God. And as, for, as we start this morning, I just want to begin with, with a word of prayer uh, as, we, as we ask for God to move in these moments. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your movement and for your love for us. And I pray that you would work in each and every life this morning as we open your word. And that you would speak a word of transformation to us. That, Lord, you would take those, those rough spots in our hearts, those spots where we, are, we have become calloused, and that you, would, that you would file them away. And I pray that, Lord, you would transform our hearts, that we would see your grace and your mercy and your glory this morning. It's in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Man. Well, open your Bibles to the book of Psalms, and we're in the 84th Psalm, Psalm 84 this morning. As we continue our series, Recalibrate, and, and we're looking forward to next week when we actually get to come back together in person and worship together. So we are in Psalm 84. You know, a reality of the human condition, one that we have to be all too keenly aware of, is that that which we do frequently, we esteem lightly. That which we do frequently, we esteem lightly. If you do a certain thing repetitively, it, it can quickly become old hat, kind of passe. You start it, it, it's kind of interesting, it's kind of cool maybe, but that excitement and, and that luster just wear off over time. I remember growing up, uh, I, I would watch my dad, when I was a little kid, and I'd see him out there, he'd be mowing, he'd be on that riding lawnmower, and he'd be going around the yard. Man, I was like, that is so cool. Mainly because you're a kid, and you see somebody driving anything, you're just like, that is awesome. I want to do that. Um, and, but he would go out and do that, and I remember thinking, you know, one day, one day I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be able to do that. I'm looking forward to that day. Now, finally, my day came. And man, I was so excited. I got to go out there, drive uh, the lawnmower and, and do all that stuff. And it was great. But over time, that newness wore off. Didn't help that that riding lawnmower broke and died. And dad decided, well, since I'm not mowing the yard anymore, Alan can certainly do with a push mower. So that didn't help the situation any. And, but but what, what happened there is because I had to do it over and over and over again, what was new and exciting quickly became a chore that was loathsome. What was new and exciting at one time became a loathsome chore to me. I didn't want to do it. I mean, I could just, I'd much rather just like let it grow real high, mow it once and let it grow real high again and stretch it out. But that didn't work. But this is, this is just the reality of living in a fallen world. The, that wonder of new things just wears off so quickly. We lose our interest. We lose our excitement. And the same thing happens to us in our spiritual lives if we're not careful. If we're not careful, what will happen is those spiritual disciplines that we practice, that we build into our lives, can quickly become old hat, can quickly become something that instead of bringing joy, they... Just become a chore that we have to go through. We become cumbersome. And one area that we have to be careful with that, especially as a church and as a people, is in the area of worship. Because every Sunday until recently, but we would come together, and, and if we aren't careful, what will happen over time is, you know, you just kind of get in a rut. Things start happening. Maybe the kids are a little crazy that morning. Maybe something else happens, and before you know it, you're going to church, you're going to worship, but really you're just phoning it in. You're going through the motions. Now, some churches have recognized this tendency, and they've caught to, to kind of sought to kind of help kind of offset that a little bit. But you can go in the wrong way there, and, and, and I've seen some churches who, who make their worship service almost become a, a weekly production where they're trying to do something that's going to grab your attention and make you excited. 
But here's the problem. That quickly becomes a show we put on. You're always going to have to do something new, something bigger, something more fantastic. And so what I want us to do is to step back and recalibrate our hearts in worship to what we should be focusing on. So that that worship thrills our souls in a way that the other stuff can't. So we're looking at Psalm 84 this morning, and here's what we read. How lovely are your dwelling places, O Lord of hosts. My soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. The bird also has found a house, and the swallow a nest for herself, that she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. How blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. How blessed is the man whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. Passing through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The early rain also covers it with blessing. They go from strength to strength. Every one of them appears before God in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. Behold, our shield, O God, and look upon the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord is a sun and shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. As we read this psalm, as we break it down, we see it happens in three strophes, three sections, each with four verses. And each section shows us a truth that we need to grasp to recalibrate our heart. It's, it's, almost, like a, it's almost like a diamond. You, you turn it just slightly and it reflects a light a different way and it's showing us a different truth. And that's what we have here in Psalm 84. And so we need to understand what worship is and how God wants to move in our hearts there. And so in verses 1 through 4, we, we find the central truth that we need to grasp. It's that worship begins with a deep longing for God's presence. Worship begins with a deep longing for God's presence. Look what he says in verse 2. He says, my soul longed and even yearned for the courts of the Lord. This is, there's this burning desire to be in the presence of God in the temple. That's, that's what he wants. There's this fullness of joy being in the presence of God that pulls at his heart because he knows he's not finding it anywhere else. And that's why he says, look, he says right next to you, my heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Being in the presence of God just, just does something that nothing else can. And there's a very simple reason for that. That is exactly what we were made for. And so what I want us, what I want us to do is just to, to, to quickly zoom out and let's take a big picture view of the Bible to understand what it means for us to be people in the presence of God. And it all starts in Genesis 1 where God creates everything that is from nothing that was and including in, included in that is humanity. And in Genesis 2, we see that God creates us with a unique ability to relate to himself. He, he places Adam in the garden. He makes Eve, and they have this ability to relate to God in a way that no other creature has. Humanity is unique. We have this relationship with God. But then we find out in Genesis 3, sin messes that whole thing up. And, and so sin, with sin, that relationship is broken. And Adam and Eve are then driven from the presence of God out into the wilderness. It's all messed up. But just fast forward to the New Testament and we see Jesus comes. And we read in John 1.14 that that. The word, that's Jesus, he became flesh. And look what it says, he, he dwelt among us. God the Son dwells among his people. Jesus in this moment and throughout his ministry is in the process of undoing what sin has wrecked. 
He's bringing us back to God, bringing us into that relationship and into that fellowship where we can dwell among, dwell with God. And it's culminated in Revelation chapter 21. We read in verse 3, new heaven and new earth. And we read, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he, being God, he will dwell among them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. That's where we're going. All right there. God dwelling among his people. New heaven, new earth. New dwelling with God. That's what we were created for. We just take this kind of big picture summary. We're created to live into his presence. Sin messes that whole thing up. It drives us from the presence of God. And the whole rest of the Bible is about God restoring that relationship, bringing us into his presence through the work of Jesus Christ. And so Psalm 84 falls on that line, that though that big storyline, because it's focused on the temple. In the Old Testament, the temple is a visual representation, a visible manifestation of where God wants to dwell among his people. Obviously, it's an it's an imperfect representation. But that's what he's talking about. It's where he's looking at. The, the psalmist longs for God's presence. In fact, in verse 3, we find out he's even jealous of the birds who build their nest at the temple. Like That's how, that's how much he, he wants this. And in verse 4, he says that those who dwell at the temple are blessed because they get to praise God all the time. And as we step back and as we consider what this means for our own worship, we need to take stop stock and keep the presence of God as the central focus of our worship. Let me just ask a diagnostic question here. If all we had was a copy of the Word of God, the songs we had memorized to sing, and the presence of God, would would that be enough for us in worship? Take away the instruments, take away the lights, take away the technology, take away the building. Is that enough for us? Is that enough for us? Is being in the presence of God enough for us in worship? Let me just go on record as saying, look, if that sounds dull to us, that sounds a little lackluster, then we need to ask God to transform our hearts. We need to ask, Lord, thrill our souls with your presence in worship. We're asking God to to give us a soul-satisfying joy in his presence because in the end, nothing else will be able to satisfy our souls except God alone. But this psalm also lays out for us how God works in our lives to produce that desire. So in verse 5 through 8, we find out that God's grace in our trials revitalizes our worship. God's grace in our trials revitalizes our worship. Look what he says. He says, God, verse 5, God is the strength of his people. Right? It's not their strength. It's theirs. It's God's. And their hearts are directed to God's presence. They, They want to go up to Zion. They desire to be in the presence of God. But look where the path lies. Verse 6. The passing through the valley of Baca, the valley of tears, the valley of weeping. You get the picture of those who are drawn near to God. They're they're going up to the temple, but the path leads them straight through the path, straight through the valley of tears, through the valley of heartache, through the valley of pain. And we can relate. Like when we seek to draw closer to God, our path often leads us through pain, through tears, through heartache. Maybe you're in the middle of that valley right now. Lots of job, finances are tight. Maybe right now you're in that valley. You're asking God, God, where where are you? That's why I love the, the hymn, How Firm a Foundation, This specifically this verse. 
where it says, when through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow will not overflow. For I, this is God speaking, I will be with you, your trials to bless and sanctify to you your deepest distress. It's exactly what's laid out for us in verse 6 here. It says, the early rain also covers it with blessing. Look what God does here. He sends the early rain into the valley of tears to provide a blessing. God, in the middle of pain, provides grace in the form of a life-giving rain. Can you identify there? If you've been through one of those times, you've been through the valley, and God sends the showers of his grace at just the right moment. I've been there, and I know many of you have been there. I mean, we've been through, we've walked through that valley together. Maybe you've had those days when you're wondering, God, where are you? I don't have it. And then right at that right moment, he shows up and he pours out the rains of his grace. He never left you, but he was leading you through the valley, showing you his goodness. And that's what, that's what makes verse 7 so poignant. Look what he says. They go from strength to strength. You come to know God's strength and his power in the valley in a way you can't know it if you never go through it. Think about this. When God leads us through the valley, he wants to bring us into his presence in worship. That's what he says. Look, they're going there. Every one of them appears before him in Zion. And, and it's his presence and his powers that sustains us in the valley that gives us a new depth, a new strength, and a new life in worship. Like, I can remember going through times and, and coming out on the other side, and, and there was just a new level of trust and joy and worship. Maybe I'm singing the same songs, but all of a sudden they had a new vibrance, a new meaning, a new depth to them that wasn't there before because of what God led me through. Because I had experienced the presence and the grace of God in a new way in the valley that I could sit there and say, God, this is amazing. You are amazing. didn't like going through the valley. Nobody ever does. But God works in that time. And right now, some of you are in there. Some of you are in there. And you just want to get through. You just need to see, you just can't see how this end well, ends well, though. Like, you're, you're really struggling. How, God, does this end well for me? I, I cannot make these pieces line up in a way that looks good. How are you possibly going to do something with this train wreck? Just let me encourage you. Look, God is with you in the middle of the valley, and he's going to show you his grace. And the greatest proof of that, if you ever wonder, will he be working for my good in this? Just look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Just look to the cross of Jesus Christ, because at the cross, Jesus Christ endures the worst, most sinful, most unjust, act of all human history. If you think it can't get any bad, worse for you, look at Jesus. This is how bad it gets. And in that moment, God the Son is unjustly humiliated, unjustly broken, and unjustly put to death. And while the world saw a good man being put to death, so much more is happening. Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and he bore the sin, the weight of our sin and our guilt to give us forgiveness and to reconcile us to God. So we can have a relationship with God, that relationship that we were created for in the, work, in the first place. So we can be forgiven, so that we can be washed clean, so that we can have forgiveness and newness of life through faith in Jesus Christ. And if God, if God can take that horrible event and work salvation for us, we can trust that in anything else, no matter how bad it looks, God will be working to display his grace and his mercy and his love. You may not like going through it. You probably won't. But God will work through it to produce a desire in you that he could not produce otherwise. 
Well, God's working in that. He's producing something in that. But, but not only does he guide us through trials to produce the desire for his presence. Look what happens next in verse 9 through 12. Here's what we find out, that his presence, God's presence alone satisfies our souls. God's presence alone satisfies our souls. Look what he says in verse 10. He says, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand outside. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Grasp this amazing contrast, this, this dichotomy that the psalmist is putting out for us here. So it's like he's got one of those, those scales with weights on each side. And over here, he says, look, you can put all the stuff you want. Just, just pile it on. Make it high. Make it tall. Make it heavy. And you just see this side weighed down. And he says, okay, that's fine. But just take this one little pebble, which is the presence of God. One day in God's presence, let me put it on the scale, and immediately it's just going to throw it all off. He says, look, you've got to understand that one day in the presence of God is so much greater than all the other stuff in the world. That, that, that's that's mind-boggling to us. Look what he says. He says, that's the way it is. One day is better than a thousand. I'd rather stand at the door or the threshold than dwell in the tents. And here's why this only makes sense. This only makes sense if we understand that the greatness of the glory of God is the sole satisfying thing for which we were created. That our souls were created to find satisfaction only in the greatness of God's glory. In God himself. In a thousand days away from the presence of God, we cannot find enough stuff to satisfy that deepest longing of our soul. We, we can't do it. There's not enough stuff you can kind of put in there that's going to satisfy you. There's not going to do it. <laughs> not just in a thousand days, not in a thousand years, not in a thousand lifetimes. There's not enough stuff in this world that could possibly satisfy your soul. And that single reality drives us to worship because it means ultimately God is the only one who is worthy of our praise and our honor and our glory. It is Him alone who is worthy of all this because He alone can satisfy us. It causes us to look around at everything else and say, you know what, there's some good things here, but none of it, none of it is worthy of my worship. And let's get real right now. This Right now, this world is spending billions upon billions of dollars trying to get you to buy the promise that something else will satisfy you. That something else is worthy of your worship. And they're sending you messages that if you just had this particular thing or maybe you achieved this goal, your life is going to be complete. Just put your hope here, and it'll deliver everything you've ever hoped for. And by this point, by, by this point, you think, you think we would have realized that nothing ever quite lives up to its hype. You would think that. We've only, we've been let down so many times, we've reached those goals, we've gotten that stuff, and we get to the end and we realize we're just as empty as we were before we had it. I mean, it's, it's all because they're offering us false idols who cannot satisfy. We only have to look at a couple of patterns to see it played out. Think about the idol of technology. 50, 60 years ago, they thought, you know what? Technology is going to make our lives so great. It's going to solve our problems. We're going to be more productive. We'll have more free time, more leisure time. We'd have, we'd have to bless. It'd be great. But this is where we have to understand that technology, while it's good, it's not God. We're still facing a lot of the same problems. I, I mean, we even have new problems 
that technology is creating. It, it can't satisfy. It can't deliver on that promise. We now work more. We have less free time. And we're less satisfied. So if you're putting your hope in that, it just doesn't work out. But, but we also see a, a new kind of idol popping up in our, in our culture over the last kind of decade. It's the idol of the like. The idol of the like. Social media has kind of made this beast where every picture has carefully choreographed, carefully cropped, has had the perfect filter over it to get the maximum number of likes possible. Because when you get that, hey, that's affirmation. That's going to make you feel good. You're going to feel great if you just get a certain number of followers, a certain number of likes. But we found you have to do it over and over and over and over again. Because no matter how high the number, it's never going to be high enough. It's never going to be high enough to satisfy that deepest longing in your soul. And the reality that we all have to face is, is that so many of the things that are fighting for our worship, they're promising to satisfy us. But what we have to face is the reality that none of them can. And we have to lift our eyes to heaven and say, only God can satisfy that longing. Only God can do that. Only God that can take that deep longing of our soul and satisfy it with himself. And that's why in verse 11, the Lord says, the Lord, uh, the psalmist says, the Lord is a sun and a shield. Now we get the, we get the shield part there, right? He's a, de he's a defender. He's our defense. That's, we get that. But what in the world does it mean for God to be a son here? He's our son. He, and, and think about it. We need the son for light, for life. And when we have the son, it gives us, it gives us joy. Think about it this way. You've had it, it's been cloudy for three or four days. All of a sudden that sun comes out. And, and immediately to your face, there's just a sense of relief at the light. So in the same way, God is our light, our life, and our joy. He has nothing, what nothing else can do and what no one else can give us, God gives because he made us to find satisfaction in him alone. All the time that we are chasing after those false idols, hoping that they're going to find satisfaction, God is calling us saying, look, I'm the only one who can provide that. You can't find it elsewhere. And in worship, we refocus our hearts. We recalibrate them. And we start singing those praises to God. Everything else takes a back seat. Because in Him, we find our joy. Our, our deep-seated joy in the depths of our souls. Because He is the Lord, and he is the one who is worthy of our worship. He is the one who calls us into his presence, into a relationship to find what we most desperately need. And as we look forward to next week when we start the process of regathering, we need to recalibrate our hearts. Now, one of the things that we know is that not everybody is going to be able to get back with us next week. You're immune and compromised. If you live with someone who is, that maybe this isn't your time. That's fine. But as we're looking over the course of the next couple of weeks, as we start that process of regathering, we want to make sure that as we gather for worship, we gather with an eye to what is truly important, what is truly great. And so we want to we wanna come with that deep longing to be in the presence of God so that we can reflect on God's grace in our trials to give life to our worship so that we can look to his presence and be satisfied in him. And so I want to challenge you this week as we look toward next Sunday, as we look toward that day when we're back together. I want you to take time this week and just work through these truths. Pray, God, Lord, give me, a, give me a longing to be in your presence. 
you know, maybe take some time in prayer, just, just reflecting on those valleys that God has brought you through and the grace he showed you at those different points. And let that gratitude well up into you. So when we come to sing and we come to praise him for his greatness and his goodness, that that, that just sort of bubbles up from inside of us. Then take some time to ask God, look, Lord, where are those false idols that I have placed in my heart? The ones that are that I've falsely believed will satisfy. Where are they? Lord, root them out of my heart. That's what we want. So that, so that we understand in those moments, look, God, I'm not focused on anything else except for you, your presence, and your glory. And I'm finding what my soul most desperately needs in you. My satisfaction and my joy in you. So we, when we come together as a church, when we come together, we can experience a new vitality and a new joy as we enter into the presence of Almighty God as his people. Now, I know for some of you, it's a little foreign because you've never taken the step of, of placing your faith in Jesus Christ. You've been through the valley, but you've never experienced the grace. And you've had all these things you thought were going to make you whole, but they didn't. I want to invite you this morning to find in Jesus Christ that for which you were made, that for which you were created, to have fellowship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So I'd love to talk to you about how to begin that process. And and. and you can either start that by either calling the church, 972-885-9366. I'd love to talk to you about what it looks like to begin the process of walking with Jesus. Or you can text, again, 972-885-9366. I'd love to talk with you about how you can begin a new life full of joy in the presence of God. Well, thanks so much for joining us this morning. I'm praying for you, and I'm looking forward to the time when we come back together as a people of God and sing his praises together. Thank you so much, and I will see you next week.